Good morning. Uh, it, it's my honor to introduce uh, today's speaker, uh, Yuan Dongtian. Uh, he's a research scientist and manager in Facebook AI research. And he's, uh, he's been working on deep reinforcement learning and its applications in games, uh, the theoretical analysis of deep models. So he's a lead scientist and engineer for EIL, uh, ELF, OpenGo, and Dark for Forest Go project. So he's going to introduce uh, this uh, data-driven sequential decision-making process by using reinforcement learning and op optimization. Thanks. Uh, okay. Thanks all for attending the talk. So today I'm going to talk about uh, data-driven sequential decision-making, uh, reinforcement learning and optimization. People may wonder, uh, the, the title is kind of weird, right? Because uh, reinforcement learning and optimization, they look like two different directions. So this is actually related to the career that I have taken uh, since I was a PhD. Uh, so basically, I'm basically working on like two parallel things. One is more on the application side. So uh, previously it was computer vision, and now uh, I switched to reinforcement learning. And on the other side, I'm also uh, continue working on non-convex optimization, which is on the more on the theoretical side. So I'm, I basically try to keep my best to push these two directions at the same time. So uh, the reason why I'm doing that is because uh, we know that we only, if we only work on theory, then what happens is uh, you might get trapped into uh, a lot of uh, assumptions that may not be realistic. But if you want to, if you want to work on application only, then uh, we might uh, get lost by a lot of evidences from the application side. So I think a combination of both might be interesting. So uh, today I'm going to talk about this uh, giant topic called the sequential decision making process, in which we study from like state, and then we try to uh, find a decision, a sequence of decisions, so that uh, it leads to good consequences. So this is a very general uh, introduction, and if we want to uh, make them concrete, then it will basically split into these two special cases. And for example, if the agent is allowed to uh, choose by its own will, then it will basically go to reinforcement learning, in which uh, an agent is uh, trying to find the best action so that to maximize the reward, and, uh, in particular the cumulative reward. On the other side, uh, if the agent was not able to choose its uh, destiny and we want to uh, analyze the behavior of the overall performance, then it basically go to the optimization region. So in, in which we have a, a non-convex uh, landscape and we start from initialization and then try to see whether uh, the agent can actually go to a local optimum or not. So, uh, so in uh, in order to introduce these two different works, I'm going to put a summarization of uh, these two branches. So, on the in the reinforcement learning side, I've been working on this uh, reinforcement learning framework, uh, which is called ELF, and also we try to apply this framework to uh, reproduce Alpha Zero, uh, which is the recent product called the ELF Open Go. And uh, we also work on model-based reinforcement learning in which uh, we are trying to uh, learn a model from the environment uh, so that that environment, uh, that model can be used to predict uh, uh, the trajectory uh, that we want to take in the future. And uh, we also apply uh, our approach to uh, reinforcement applications. Uh, this include the multiple games like Miniatis and its uh, uh, sequel, as well as uh, uh, other games like um, uh, the first-person shooting game. On the optimization side, uh, there's two different directions. One is called data-driven optimization. So this is basically my PhD uh, work uh, in which we try to find a, a good uh, guarantees for uh, uh, iterative approaches uh, that combines gradient descent and nearest neighbor. And recently, we also I, uh, applied the idea to combinatorial optimization problems to find a nice and interesting heuristics so that the combinatorial optimization problem can be solved in a much more efficient and uh, uh, faster manner. So on the other side, uh, I've been working on the theory for neural networks. So that's a bunch of works that align that direction, try to understand uh, the principle and the behaviors of uh, uh, a latent uh, with one hidden layer neural networks. So and now I'm also working on this multi-layer neural network analysis, but that is super hard and uh, uh, more progress needs to be made. OK, so let me first start with uh, the reinforcement branch. So on the reinforcement branch, uh, I think uh, we can start with this AlphaGo series. I think this is basically uh, a bunch of uh, very amazing work from DeepMind. So it's starting from like uh, the March uh, of uh, 2016, where we actually find there's a 
uh, there's a bot called AfroGo that can uh, beat professional Go players. And in this game of Go, which is, has a history of 2.5 uh, thousand years, and uh, people usually think that that game is probably uh, cannot be solved by, uh, by computer. But now we can actually see that lots of uh, strong players that are coming and they are all computers. And uh, we can see there's a continuous trend from AlphaGo and to very recent, uh, which is in uh, 2017, uh, where the AlphaGo Zero comes out and it claims that uh, it can train uh, the stupid human Go player without any human knowledge, which is super impressive. However, although the result is impressive, there's no code and there's no model. <laughs> so this is, uh, uh, this is a, a, actually a pity that because the entire research community was not able to reproduce it and uh, do not have the computational power to reproduce it. And this actually created a lot of issues and people actually thought about uh, a lot of mysteries. So this is a mystery that uh, uh, people will think about. Some people will think, okay, it's kind of skeptical, maybe uh, because uh, they choose the parameter to the death so they can actually train it well. And the other people, a set of people maybe think about, yeah, maybe the algorithm is very universal. Maybe uh, we can actually solve every problem with the same algorithm, which may not be the case. So, and also there's a lot of uh, lack of ablation studies. Uh, so for example, which factor is critical and uh, is there any weakness in the algorithms? It's very hard to, uh, to actually solve it. So uh, uh, because we actually have a peer experience, um, uh, computer Go, we, we go ahead and trying to reproduce it. So we have this, our previous experience, which is called Dark Forest. And uh, this is actually a, a, a Go bot that is released three months before AlphaGo. So it released on like uh, uh, November uh, 2015, uh, which is uh, uh, basically done by uh, my interns and me. And we actually uh, 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 participate a few competitions and got good performance. But uh, after the three months, we see the AlphaGo drop, bump dropping, and uh, people all uh, realize that uh, AlphaGo is the best. Um, so uh, we're trying to use that uh, as a basis to reprodu uh, reproduce AlphaGo and AlphaZero. So first of all, I want to introduce uh, what does that mean uh, to do self place and uh, what does AlphaGo do to make uh, the, a superhuman performance. So uh, first, it started with like a random uh, models. Uh, so the random models is uh, being used for doing a many color tree search play, which is basically a, a kind of particular way of doing search, uh, starting from an empty board. So we do many color tree search at every situation of the board, and then in many color tree search, we we'll try to give you a dis distribution uh, of uh, the policy. And we we'll try to use the distribution of the policy to generate the next action. And you use the next action, and uh, you move that board forward into uh, one uh, move ahead, and then use that, uh, use another states and use that states to do many color tree search again until you actually find uh, who is the winning of that game. So we basically use that as a training samples. So you collect a lot of training samples called cell plays because it's basically play against itself and use that play, uh, to update the model to get a new parameter, theta, maybe theta i plus one, and then use the new parameters model uh, to generate uh, the new cell plays again. So you do this iteratively. So it looks like a very simple approaches. You just ask the current model to beat against itself and then use the data uh, to train the model. So, but surprisingly, I mean, over a lot of iterations of this, you actually get a super good performance. So here's like a, a better uh, summarization of uh, how it works. So here's basically the Minicard tree search side. So this is a kind of search to find a good policy under the current model. And for each of the search, you basically get a triples. So each triple is uh, the states the policy that you get from many card tree search and the final consequence of the game. So you put all this uh, data together into uh, as a training samples. So you run it lots of uh, such games uh, and you get a tons of training samples. And use that training samples to actually learn this uh, jumped convolutional network. So network is very simple. Uh, you basically uh, starting from a 90 by 19 board, that is the starting point uh, of the image. And uh, this is basically like uh, has no uh, human knowledge invited into it, but just a representation of uh, the input features. Right? So here you basically represent where are the black stones, where are the white stones, and uh, uh, they are like very recent histories. And, and also which color to play because uh, Go is not a symmetric game. And the black who plays first actually has a disadvantage. So you basically study with all these features that has nothing to do with the game semantics. Uh, but and just go through that with uh, a bunch of new networks. So uh, here you basically have a, it's like one resonant block, 
and then you multiply, you just duplicate this US network by 20 times or 40 times. And finally, you output both the policy and the value. And the, the supervised learning here is trying to match the policy uh, with the, uh, the pi, which is the uh, policy given by the medical tree search. And then you match the value V uh, to the final consequence of the game Z. Right? And also you have a regularization constant. And then you basically train this model and you get a better estimate theta. And you use that model with a better estimate of theta to uh, do a self-play again. You do this intuitively and you, until you get superhuman performance. So it's, uh, the method seems super simple. But surprisingly, it gives you super good performance. I mean, if you just train it with three days, and you, what you get is uh, you can already have a bot that is, can defeat uh, the bot uh, that defeat the, uh, the, 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 the world champion in Seto, right? So if you train like a, a train model with 40 days uh, with like a, a larger uh, network, then you actually can uh, beat uh, uh, called the AlphaGo Master, which is uh, a very strong bot that beat uh, all the professional player by 60 to zero. So uh, then like we want to reproduce it, we use the framework called ELF, which is uh, a, a abbreviation of extensive, lightweight, and flexible framework for game research. And uh, we, uh, this, this is already being uh, published in NIPS, uh, in Europe in 2017. And uh, we make it distributed uh, so that it can actually handle uh, the AlphaGo 0 and AlphaGo 0 setting. Note that the difference between these two is uh, AlphaGo 0 is a very strict uh, a sequential optimization of, uh, procedure in which uh, you first generate all the data and then train it. And alpha zero is like a synchronized, a, a, a synchronized version of it. So you basically doing, uh, do uh, data generation at the same time you train a model and uh, they are not blocking to each other. So uh, finally, we uh, have this uh, called Alpha Open Go. So uh, this system is basically trained with 2,000 GPUs in two weeks, exactly less than two weeks, like uh, nine days, and uh, achieve super performance against professional players and a uh, very strong bot. And uh, we also provide that with abundant ablation studies. And um, uh, we have already open sourced the code and uh, open sourced the pre-trained models and uh, open sourced all the self-play games, uh, which has 20 million of them. So, and uh, since uh, we have open source, there's a lot of uh, interest and a lot of people actually using uh, the models, especially in the Go community. All professional Go players actually are using it. Uh, so here's like a performance. Uh, we invite uh, uh, four professional players from a Korean Go Association and uh, ask them to play against our bot. Uh, in our side, we only use single GPU to play it and uh, each move only takes like uh, 50 seconds. And uh, on the human side, we offer them unlimited thinking time for the players. And, but, and, but unfortunately, uh, they, they, they still lose the game. Uh, so each of the player only uh, basically play like five games. So we basically win like 20 to zero to all of them with a single GPU. And here's like uh, the, how the value function changes. So value function means uh, the win rates estimated by the bot. So you see that usually the value function will go all the way to, to, to 1.0, which means that the bot will think it will win. But uh, you actually see a, lot, a, a bit of drops, which basically means that there are some issues still remains remaining in the, uh, in the, in the, in the final bot that's being used. So here we anonymous all the players' names. Uh, so we also have uh, uh, compared with uh, the professional, uh, the, 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 the Lida Zero, which is basically a community effort for training an AlphaGo Zero. And they have already uh, trained their model for like half a year by the time we compare with them and uh, we beat them with uh, 98.2 uh, uh, times. But now I think they are, they are substantially better because uh, of our open source of the models. And they basically use our model as the basis to train their models and they all become substantially better. So uh, one interesting question is what we learned. Right? So uh, first of all, uh, what we learned is uh, uh, first, you can still see like uh, the training is going up and, uh, and uh, despite there's a lot of variations. So uh, it's starting from like their winning rates compared to all the three prototypes. So there are three prototypes, which is basically uh, trend uh, the landmarks of uh, the, the training process. So the prototype alpha has a very strong amateur level and the prototype beta has a professional level. And the prototype is basically the superhuman level. So that's actually the model we use uh, for professional players. So after that, we actually uh, retrain the entire pipeline from scratch and try to check whether we can reproduce our own results, which is, uh, which is uh, after we have done that, then we, uh, we, are make, we, are, we are sure that uh, we can reproduce and we can publish a paper on top of that. So we see that uh, the, the win rates goes up, and, but with a lot of zigzags. So you see like there's, there's something, some, for some reason, it has to go down and go up again and go down and go up again. 
So, but uh, uh, it seems like the, it's not a smooth process as uh, what you typically see in the supervised training. And more interestingly, you will see the overfitting issues at the beginning of the training. So here you see this, uh, there's a dip in the uh, value function loss over the training. So people will, may wonder, okay, the dip of the loss should be a good thing, but actually it's not a good thing, it's really a bad thing. The reason why there's a dip in the loss is because uh, uh, the model at the beginning overestimate uh, the white win rates. And uh, this actually will cause the black to resign prematurely because the black also use the same uh, value function. So if the black uh, resign prematurely, then the black will lose many games because uh, there are some situations that black should not resign. And uh, it will actually uh, have create an imbalanced replay buffer because in the replay buffer, there's a lot of black resign game. And then you go back and uh, you use the replay buffer to train the model and you will overestimate the uh, white win rates even further. And this will actually create uh, a lot of issues because then the blacks say, okay, I'm, I'm, I give up. I, I don't want to do anything because uh, I, will, I, will, I will lose in any case. So this is actually a very uh, hard problem and it will basically drive you into headache. Uh, so you need to have a very large replay buffer and uh, to basically balance things. And also we actually have a, a mechanism that can adaptively uh, choose the resign threshold. And uh, but that has also has delays. So in order to balance that, we actually, when we are sampling the replay buffer, we actually need to uh, make sure that the sample between black wings and white wings, they are balanced in order to achieve, uh, to, to, to make that actually work. But however, I mean, despite that, it's actually quite stable. And we actually did some uh, uh, involuntary, uh, did some like uh, involuntary uh, ablation studies. These are not really ablation studies, they are basically bugs. So we find uh, there's a bug in the code and we have realized that, okay, that bug didn't really kill the process. It actually give you some worse performance. But it's still, uh, you see like a strong performance uh, if you trade all the way up. <laughs> so uh, that's, uh, but the first one is basically because uh, there's a bug in the PyTorch, uh, KR divergence, back propagation, and uh, the gradient was uh, uh, lower than expected by like 300 times. So this actually uh, prevent you from training the policy head, but it can still achieve pretty strong level, uh, which is interesting. So after we, we fix it, we find like when one day it goes up crazily. Uh, so the, the rest of them are also a little bit, but so basically means that this algorithm itself is quite stable, which is surprising. And another issue that uh, we actually discovered and also is revealed by the, by the paper uh, is the level of the ladder issues. So ladder is uh, one of the techniques that people, uh, people use when playing the goal of game. So remember that goal is a game about surroundings, right? If you have a group of uh, stones that is being surrounded by the opponent color, then that, opponent, that, that's, that group of stone will be taken away. Uh, from the board. That's a very simple rule. And uh, the ladder is basically a sequential move so that black and white has to move at, on a particular uh, location. And uh, the consequence of this battle will be decided by the other side of the board. So uh, that is actually a long range connections between uh, these two parts of stone, that two parts of stone. So because of these two properties, uh, many cultural research as well as uh, using CNN as a representation is uh, 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 it's not suitable for this kind of uh, battles. So this basically uh, means that if you check uh, the, 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 the the accuracy of, of a ladder, you will see like the, the mistakes that it makes is actually fluctuating. It's, it's basically going down gradually, but uh, even at the end of the training, it does not really go to zero. So we actually still see a lot of cases that uh, it does not, it's not able to deal with the, the very simple ladder cases. So only if we increase the number of, uh, number of rollouts, uh, we can reduce the mistake rate, but still not to zero. So uh, this is basically a problem that we probably need to uh, solve in the future if we uh, want to uh, make a very good uh, Go playing machine. But fortunately in Go, this is actually not that severe because first of all, ladder is not that often especially for people who are professional levels. And uh, second, uh, we can use more rollouts to, uh, to basically uh, eliminate these, these, these factors. And uh, what you see from the previous uh, slides, uh, these dips are basically like uh, because the bot was not able to uh, find the right moves. But even if that's the case, the, the, the bot makes like one step mistakes, but the, uh, the professional players was not able to uh, make use of these mistakes to keep all the winning rate to the, to, 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 uh, to the final game. So after that, basically the, 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 the first player actually made uh, an a suboptimal move and it will goes up and will go back to the very high level. 
Okay, so uh, we also have some comparison between alpha zero versus alpha go zero. So uh, the conclusion is here is alpha zero is much faster because there's no synchronization locks. Uh, you don't need to wait until a new model is there and uh, start restart this uh, replay uh, self play process. And uh, uh, and also uh, we can basically uh, 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 make uh, the entire sequence uh, much faster. Uh, so even if like if you have a uh, uh, if you have like data that it basically trained by multiple models, uh, you can actually show that this is uh, uh, converging. Another interesting uh, things that we see uh, is uh, uh, so here like people might wonder like why we you use, need to use medical research. Okay, why not we just use Q-learning to do the cell place? But actually, medical research is very, very important because uh, if here's like a graph, right? it only uh, if we want to apply medical research on a final model, we want to see how much stronger it could be. Right? So uh, you will see that even if with the final model, which is extremely very strong, uh, if you double the wing uh, rollouts by two uh, for the whites, uh, you actually see like super high performance compared to black. If you uh, double the size, the number of rollouts to black, you also see like a pretty high win rates against the white. Pastor, yes. I think I might have what is a rollout? Oh, rollout is like how many times you do a search. How many times you what? You do a search. So basically, for many color, I, I didn't really uh, mention how many color is working, right? So you start from like a, a MPT node, which is the current situation of the game, and then every time, uh, every rollout, you try to explore the tree until there's a leaf. And then you expand the leaf uh, to, uh, to the deeper situation. This is called a one rollout. Getting all the way down to the leaf is a rollout. Yeah, it's a one rollout. Okay. When you say a white rollout, you mean rollout when it's worth its turn. Yes, that's right, that's right. So before you actually make the move, we have to basically do how many rollouts. Okay. Um, following up on that, the leaf would represent uh, a win or just sort of a, a clearly better move? So the leaf is not representing a win or lose, it's basically representing a further situation that is still partial game. Okay. okay. Yeah. And then you basically, given the leaf, uh, you uh, call the neural network, it will give you the value and the policy. The value is basically estimate of that uh, win rate here. Right. And then you, you basically do a backup to update all the uh, win rate estimate in the, in the medical tree search. Right. The higher the root, the root is just less defined board. So it's like just a part of the board, and then the leaves are going to be more filling in from another root. Yes, that's right. That's right. So this is basically, uh, for example, this is the opening, right? And uh, this is maybe like mid game. Oh, okay. That is temporal. It's not like in. Yeah, it's temporal. It's temporal. As opposed to the game state. And yeah, like it's not. Board. Yeah, it's temporal. It's temporal. Yeah, so it's further in, into the game, but it's not end of the game, and you can use the value function to estimate the win rates and buy profit. Wait, so does that mean that you have you could have a um, a completely different tree that represents? So I mean, the temporal ordering of the game doesn't actually matter, right? Like it, it, at one particular game state, right? It's just whatever the board looks like. It does not matter how you got. Uh, but uh, because you have this uh, I mean, temporal consequence, and you can use temporal consequence to reason about things. For example, this board, if it will basically have the win rates estimated from that location, right? So I don't know what's sure, the, yeah. But when you're deciding to make a move at a particular time point, yeah, the way you got to that board, yeah, it doesn't matter. Maybe matters for like thinking about your opponent's state of mind. But yeah, 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 that's true. Exactly. But, so, but so, this, so in other words, there is a kind of like a little bit of extra. Stuff here, but it, it's fine. Yeah, it's fine. It's fine. So, I mean, if you check the representation of the states, uh, it actually has some kind of uh, uh, histories, right? So here's like a play situation at this time, and a play situation at uh, last time, and uh, the two moves beforehand, etc. Right. So there's some kind of uh, uh, encoding of the history, uh, but uh, it's not really uh, strictly speaking a uh, incomplete information game. But you can be information gain, things will be different. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. And, uh, the and uh, this basically means that, uh, come back to the MCTS. So the reason why we show this is because uh, it's, it seems like uh, the strength is still con uh, constrained by uh, the model capacity uh, rather than the medical tree search. So you can still get super strong model, even stronger model, uh, if we uh, make uh, the entire model bigger so that it has a lot of capacity. But we don't have time and we don't have resources to uh, train this 40 block model. 
which is uh, which basically spend uh, which basically will cost like forty days or even longer uh, to train, but we don't think it's uh, deserve it. So we stop at uh, twenty blocks. So another interesting thing is, uh, I mean, usually like if you do supervised training, uh, if you reduce the learning rates, things will become pretty smooth. But actually, it's not the case in my, in our implementation. So what's happening is, uh, I mean, if you have a very small learning rates, then what happens is it will not be stable anymore. The reason is that the replay buffer uh, that stores the self play games uh, be will become similar to each other. So the, basically, the model is not stop progressing. So the, the 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 games it plays against itself will remain will look like the same. And uh, once the replay buffer becomes uniform, then if we want to train the model, then this uh, model starts to overfit and replay start to forget. Uh, things that it has learned before. So that's actually a, a quite interesting phenomenon. So we basically stop at a learning rate like uh, 0 0.001, 0 0 0.001, yeah, uh, 10 to the minus 4. So there's a lot of mystery here, and uh, but still it seems like uh, the, the system can work. So then the question is uh, how to build a theoretical framework, right, and how uh, to make the entire system much more stable. This will be left to future work. Okay. So uh, besides this, uh, we also work on like a, a, a small, like a real-time strategy games called the Mini RTS. So we build like a, a small a miniature version of the real-time strategy game. And uh, this is basically very similar to StarCraft, but uh, we want to have like a few different units. And uh, we are trying to uh, use that as a very simple environment and then train, train faster and try to study like how we can uh, learn an interesting uh, strategies there. So uh, in this original version of uh, mini RTS, uh, we basically define like two discrete strategic actions, and we ask the agent to pick these uh, nine strategic actions from them using a reinforcement learning. So the training AI is very simple. You starting from like a representation of the states that is basically multi layers, each is representing x y locations and uh, different properties of the units. It will go through a convolution network for like for example in this case is for four times. It will predict uh, policy and values. So we basically train it with our policy after critical models, and we don't do any kind of reward shaping uh, unless uh, the game is ending. Uh, we back back the game is over. Uh, I mean, like a one agent is able to take over the opponent space. So here's like a, what is the trend from the, the the model. So you see that this part is basically the trend AI. The other part is the simple AI. Which is uh, uh, which has fixed the uh, strategy that is basically building five tanks and try to attack. Them. So that's uh, what it is. And uh, if you, uh, yeah, I want to make it faster. So at the beginning, uh, you will see like uh, the train AI was able to defend the opponent's attack, and uh, finally find a strategy to attack the opponents and uh, to find uh, to actually uh, win the entire game. And the interesting, like uh, this kind of strategy was not taught by uh, by human, uh, but uh, uh, was uh, discovered independently by the by the bot after you have trained the model. So we have made comparisons uh, between different models at different uh, uh, diff different training procedure. Then you will see that as usual, uh, if you train with a, a valinear uh, model, and the win rates will go that way. But it's, there will be a gap between uh, the valinear uh, and the uh, re uh, recurrent neural network model. So, which basically means that for that for this kind of game, that uh, actually has uh, incomplete information. Uh, you really need a history to uh, remember the past, and the history can can actually will be able to uh, push the performance even further. So we also try like a different kind of uh, uh, histories. So one is called uh, the build history, in which uh, we remember like uh, uh, all the his the uh, all the buildings that uh, uh, the 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 AI has seen. Uh, from the previous uh, uh, exploration, uh, and this one is basically like uh, not only the building, but also all the previous like human uh, enemy units, and you see the performance goes higher. Note that the, the entire game is incomplete information. So even if we see the entire game, when the agent is playing the game, it only see the part that belongs to it. Uh, so that part is basically black. So we also uh, uh, extended, and we are now have this called mini RTS V2. So this is uh, this is basically a work uh, uh, with a bunch of people from uh, our groups, and uh, we basically extend uh, uh, this game by uh, adding more units, and adding like a very complicated, uh, quite a, like a lower purpose the dynamics. So uh, here uh, you see like a, a, an archer was able to defeat a lancer, and the lancer was able to defeat the knights, and the knights was able to defeat an archer. So you have this kind of like a 
interesting like rope paper scissors dynamics. And hopefully we use this kind of dynamics so we can see interesting uh, behaviors uh, in this game. And not only that, we also want to uh, including languages in the training. So remember that in the previous slides, we manually define nine discrete actions, right? So this is actually very important because if you really want your agent to play uh, the, the game by uh, controlling each unit, I mean, the number of actions that is be, to be taken will be exponential. So uh, the previous one uh, was trying to avoid this problem by defining these actions manually. But now we want to uh, train an agent that can directly control each unit. But I mean, direct training is definitely not possible, but how can we actually make uh, this kind of training uh, efficient uh, and, uh, and, and possible? So we basically designed this uh, training paradigms. So we basically ask uh, two mechanical turkeys uh, to uh, play the game jointly against a, uh, an AI. One turkey can only, uh, it's called instructor, one turkey can only like type command, uh, but cannot move the units. While the other turker is uh, taking that units, uh, then taking the command and try to execute them on the units. So they will collaborate until they can win or lose the game. So uh, the interesting thing is once you have this data and uh, we can actually train an agent uh, with the, uh, the, this natural language as the bootstrapping steps, and then to fine tune everything uh, with a reinforcement learning end to end. And then we actually still show that it was able to control uh, the, uh, at the unit level uh, uh, for this entire game, and I was able to achieve better performance and pre-trained models as well as training from scratch. So I, I'm not going to put all the numbers there because uh, it's still in the progress, uh, but uh, this is the take home message. And here's basically a visualization of the replays that we have collected uh, from the uh, uh, from all the tokens. So I see like here is basic instructions. Uh, some people people will write down instructions saying, okay, what we should do uh, for the other tokens, and uh, yeah, so, and uh, the, 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 the executor will try to execute them. And this is basically a replay of a visualization to see like how uh, different things uh, works. We're going to release the code as, as well as uh, release uh, the environment uh, as soon as uh, uh, we uh, are ready. Okay, so, uh, okay, let's, come, let's switch to the another side of, the, of my work. It's uh, called data optimization. So that's a little bit, little bit different flavor. And uh, so it's more on the theoretical side. So uh, we start with like a very simple introduction. So for example, uh, we start with a general form optimization in which uh, we know that there's a data input and there's an objective function and uh, we want to have optimization procedure so that it actually comes to a solution. So this is very simple. However, uh, I mean, if we want to find optimization procedure with guarantees, then what usually happens is uh, uh, when the objective is, uh, uh, is structured, so for example, the objective has, is convex and there's a matrix factorization uh, structure and maybe the objective is linear and with linear constraint, then for almost any data input, uh, there's a solution and uh, the solution has guarantees, which is great. But what we actually met with uh, is sometimes a non-convex objective. For example, if we want to optimize a neural network. In that case, how a neural network can, in which situation a neural network can actually give you a good solution is unknown. So we don't really know in which situation it will be interesting and will give you good solutions. So uh, one thing that I'm thinking about here is, uh, I mean, maybe I mean, the assumption about uh, almost any data input is too strong. Maybe we can, uh, I mean, reduce the, we can weaken this, uh, uh, this assumption into specific distribution. So if in that case, if we have specific data distribution, then what happens is uh, for the specific distribution, maybe even with non-convex objective, you can still get some interesting solutions. So uh, in my PhD, we actually actu uh, explored that direction a little bit and uh, uh, was able to come with some uh, good optimization procedure that has guarantees on uh, non-convex uh, problems. So here's like one example. So here, like uh, when I was a PhD, I'm basically working on like uh, uh, image alignment. So you have two images, one is called template and the other is called the distorted image. And then you want to find the, the relationship between the two by finding the landmarks. So in order to uh, get this to done, you can actually write down objective function. It's called a, a very simple objective. So you basically want to warp uh, the uh, deformed image uh, so that it looks uh, similar to the template. Right, so with respect to some param image parameters, P. So this is obviously a non-convex optimization, and uh, this problem is actually uh, hard if the image is complicated. And obviously, if the image is just like a, a Gaussian bob, then this is, can even be a convex. 
but uh, in general, the email can be very complicated, and uh, this could be hard. So you can try, you can uh, learn it with uh, you can basically solve it with gradient descent, but you will get local optimality. But on the other hand, other hand, what you can do is if you already know the warping uh, parameterization form W, then what you can do is try to enumerate all the possible warps, and then uh, you use the nearest neighbor to find uh, your optimal uh, parameter P, and this will basically give you optimality because uh, as long as you have a sufficient number of samples, you already will hit your target, your test images uh, in its vicinity, right? But this actually will give you like a, a very uh, bad sample capacity because uh, it will be one over epsilon to the d, so because the, high, the, the d is the dimension of the, of the parameter. So then what happens, uh, uh, how can we get a better solution, right? So the idea here is uh, we want to combine uh, this uh, uh, gradient descent uh, with nearest neighbor uh, by doing this kind of operations. So maybe what we can do is uh, we can start from a deformed image and you try to find nearest neighbor, and, but that usually can be very far away and uh, does not give you a right uh, estimation of the parameter, but that's okay. We can actually warp uh, that deformed image to another portion of the space by using that parameter of the nearest neighbor. So that uh, warping is not perfect because uh, the estimation parameter uh, is wrong, but that's fine. As long as it's closer enough, then you can find another uh, nearest neighbor and you can basically do the same operation again and again until it goes to the uh, origin. And the final estimation of the P will be the summation of all these arrows. So surprisingly, this is interesting because you can actually do analysis on that and uh, it will give you a very good sample complexity, uh, lower than this one of epsilon to the D, you get C to the D times one of epsilon log. And uh, this is actually lower than the previous nearest neighbor. And uh, you can even, uh, you can do like uh, one thing further by using a hierarchical structure of the images and it will give you an even better uh, sample complexity bound. So that's actually an interesting uh, idea is that try to use data-driven approach to find uh, uh, the gradient descent, uh, to find the descent directions and, to, and the way it will guide you towards the, the target. So this is interesting. And uh, when we think about, okay, how about we can apply the same idea to other optimization problems? So recently we actually had uh, some ideas about the trying, apply to, trying to apply this to combinatorial optimization. So for combinatorial optimization, we know that they're all very MP complete and it's super hard to solve them. So people usually come up with the different heuristics, right? So we might come with uh, maybe like a def, uh, uh, for job scaling, maybe like a, we can schedule the shortest job first. We can schedule the job that is uh, arriving earliest first, et cetera, right? So we can try to use that to solve the problem. Uh, but uh, I mean, our, in the setting of uh, uh, using uh, data-driven approaches, maybe we can actually learn it, right? So uh, then this is actually come up with this uh, latent writing framework. So this is very similar to the previous uh, data-driven optimization ideas. We started from initial solution that is may not be good enough, but that's okay. We try to learn uh, optimizations, uh, we're trying to learn some kind of heuristic so that it will push you to a different portion of the space and then you apply that uh, heuristics again, and it will push you all the way to the local optimum. So how to learn it? Uh, so we just have, we, so we, comp uh, we uh, propose this uh, local writing framework. So we're starting from these uh, states, and uh, we basically pick like a portion of the state. And then uh, we use that portion of the state to uh, applying uh, a rule called a U, and you, this will basically, this part of the state will change to another color, which is another state, and put it back. You do this intuitively. So it's very simple. And how you train it, and we basically use uh, uh, actual critical trainings, but combined with the Q-learning. So we have two policies. One is the policy that's try to pick the, uh, pick the region, so which is called the region picker. And the other is the policy that's try to pick the rule, what kind of rule we want to apply to change the region to another portion uh, of the space. So uh, we want to learn the two. So we first need to learn Q functions to uh, fit a cumulative rewards. So here's a cumulative reward, and we want to learn a Q function on top of that. So the reason we want to do that is uh, Q function, if you just apply DQN, et cetera, it's kind of slow to uh, learn a Q function because uh, you need to have, uh, uh, you need to basically like iterate, uh, update all the Q functions one after another, which is uh, not ideal. So here we just want to put using a Q function to, to predict the reward itself. And then once you have a Q function and you can come up with the policy, which is the region picker, and you can use that region picker uh, to actually uh, learn uh, a rule picker. So you have to pick the rule that can be applied in other particular region. So we are, I'll do application on this, uh, actually three. I mean, I will go into talk about the, the third one. The first one is uh, to is online job scheduling. So you have a bunch of jobs, each has a different, uh, so this is basically how the uh, setting is done. So you have jobs which has different lengths. 
and a different resource requirements and also different arriving times. So A is the arriving time and T is the length of the job. And the, these two colors means like how much resources you want to use uh, for each of the type. So here you may see mean that you want to use a little bit resource one, but a lot of resource two. But here job three means like uh, you want to use uh, a lot of resource one, but uh, only a few resource two, right? So there could be two different scheduling. So one is, uh, for example, here, uh, this scheduling two is the basic scheduling. You want to execute the jobs one after another, right? So you're starting from uh, the job one and then job two and then job three. Then because job three is uh, arriving at earlier, so it, there will be a lot of slowing time, slowing down time for job three. And, uh, but we can actually make things better by uh, concurrently execute uh, job uh, two and uh, job three at the same time. So because these two actually have complementary resource requirement, so they can be executed uh, simultaneously. So you can basically do that. And uh, this actually corresponds to different graph representations. And we want to basically ma massage this graph representation so that uh, the overall slowing down time is minimal. So actually compare with different baselines. So this includes like uh, earliest, earliest job first, shortest job first, and et cetera. And also even for offline uh, baselines, uh, for example, uh, the baselines are provided by the Google OR tools and uh, also the shortest job first, but uh, in offline setting. So by offline, what I mean is uh, now we actually uh, uh, foresee all the future jobs that has arrived. And then we condition on these future jobs. So we want to find optimal uh, schedule. So which it turned out that our approach is actually having the lowest uh, uh, slowing down time in all the cases. And uh, especially for uh, when the number of resources is larger. So when the things become more complicated, and we're going to see our approach remains, remains like a lower. And we also try to compare uh, different distributions. So what happens if the job scheduling uh, job has different distribution? So for example, if the job uh, may have a uniform distribution in terms of resource distributions, may have a non-uniform distribution in terms of resource distributions, what happens with, with all these approaches? Then what happens, you see that usually our approach is still remains the lowest, but there are some exceptions. For example, uh, when the jobs are uniform, then our approach is actually worse than them. So which basically means that in the situation that things are kind of uh, uniform, then maybe we don't really need a complicated approaches. We just need like simple heuristics. But when the situation become complicated, for example, things are non-uniform, the jobs are dynamics, uh, 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 then in that situation, uh, the every slowdown time is uh, actually alleviated by our approach. So we also try an, a second uh, uh, application, which is uh, the expression simplification, so in which we starting from a mass expression. So this is a mass expression, and you want to find uh, a sequence of actions so that it finally simplifies to a very simple uh, 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 expression. So here, you starting from here and then you go all the way to one. So which basically means that uh, this uh, expression is always true. But how can we find this path? It's, it's a problem. So we basically do the using the same idea and uh, try to uh, replace uh, one subtree of the uh, mass expression at a time. Uh, and then we try to do this intuitively. And we're able to show that our approach in terms of like, average expression length reduction, so for this number, it should be higher the better. So our approach is actually higher than uh, a lot of uh, other approaches. This include the heuristics and also uh, the theorem prover uh, tools called the Z3 uh, in different situations. And we also can show we also can show that our approach can actually generalize to uh, different situations. For example, uh, if we only train on uh, only like a, uh, only a, 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 a tree with only like a 20 lengths, right? So we can actually generalize to uh, different situations when the the length of the expression is longer than 100. So this is actually a good uh, transferring test and show that our approach can generalize. So finally, we also uh, did the uh, experiments for a uh, satisfiable test. So this is basically like a, a, a very famous uh, NP hard problems uh, because any NP problems can be reduced to it. Uh, so in the satisfiable test, uh, you basically have a formula and this formula is basically in this uh, called uh, uh, con uh, conjecture uh, normal form. So you have a, a bunch of clauses. Each of clauses are basically uh, uh, an average and uh, basically every uh, and, and all of a bunch of literals. And uh, be between these clauses, and they are connected by end. So, in order to satisfy uh, the, the entire formula, you want to make sure that every clause has to be satisfied, has to be true. So, but it's very hard to find an assignment to uh, to make all this uh, correct. 
So uh, we actually compare with the neural-based search servers, and this, these two papers are the previous work, and they are ba they basically are, submit, uh, are accepted by uh, ICR uh, last year. So we were able to get good performance compared to uh, what the, they have, so in different variables. Uh, so basically starting from like uh, 10 variables all the way to 80 variables. And we also compare with uh, uh, a bunch of previous works uh, that has uh, that also evaluated on the, the set lab, set lib, which is a public data set uh, that uh, contain a lot of random generated uh, SAT uh, instances and uh, performance are better. Okay. So, uh, so, but however, we have to say that I mean, it's still very far away from the commercial servers. So if we compare with the uh, industrial servers in which they are not using any deep learning, they're not using any training models, they just uh, use uh, simple heuristics to do the search, it's still way, way, way below them. So I think uh, for industrial servers, they can solve, for example, 1 million variables uh, instances in like uh, maybe uh, a few minutes. So, which is uh, still uh, a large gap, but I think uh, this could be an interesting direction to explore, and uh, maybe in the future we're going to see uh, much better uh, neural-based solvers. Mm -hmm. No, no, I think uh, we haven't. Uh, so we actually compare with them. I think uh, I mean, there's still a huge gap. So there's a bunch of like a uh, free solvers called uh, for example, mini set. Glucose. Like actually, I, and I don't know if the robust commercial. Uh, you mean like uh, glucose? Glucose is not commercial. Glucose is uh, is a uh, is a free server. You can download that. Yeah, but uh, I think it's not comparable because uh, you can easily solve like uh, I have tried by myself, right? You can solve like 400k variables with uh, a few sec, few minutes. So that's not. Uh, it's still there's a huge gap there. Yeah, but this is basically like initial work uh, to see. It seems like there's some kind of hope there. And if we uh, continue working on that, maybe in the future, there are going to be a good uh, neural-based uh, SAT service. Okay, uh, so that's my talk. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> questions? I have a question about the Trilla last night. Yes. Um, I'm wondering, uh, why do you think your method is um, performing worse than commercial solvers? Okay. You mean, I mean, like, in terms of speed? Uh, yeah, I mean, like, uh, is it just that you're overfitting data or something? No, no, I think uh, the question, the, the current issue is, uh, I mean, you cannot, using the same framework, you cannot run on uh, 1 million variables. Oh, uh, so. Yeah, because uh, here you basically need to encode the tree, right? So we basically, like, uh, uh, represents this uh, formula as, as a graph, right? And then you want to compute uh, messages, you want to compute uh, features in the graph. Yeah. And uh, in order to compute the messages or the features in the graph, then I mean, if a graph with 1 million nodes, then it will be super slow. And we haven't tried that yet. So maybe that, that actually works, but I don't know. We haven't tried that yet. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, yeah, so about the uh, Go stuff. Yes. Um, uh, so do you only, and does the community only ever look at 19 by 19 Go? Or do they look at? They actually look a lot on eight, uh, 9 by 9 Go. Is that yeah. easier, strictly? Uh, interestingly, I actually asked uh, deep, one deep learning engineers on that. They say that it's actually, they, can, they cannot apply the approach on 9 by 9. Yeah. Uh, because the reason is is uh, nine, uh, nine by nine black X actually has a huge disadvantage, yeah. and uh, that actually prevent you from training. Uh, this is basically the issues. For example, nine by nine, okay, black find okay, there's no way can win the game. Are there not ways to penalize black to kind of make up for that? Yeah, I think uh, that definitely. I mean, for example, it can you can actually control this number. It's a number called comb. Yeah. Uh, that comb basically means that how much point uh, you should uh, deduct from the black final territory. That should be resolvable. Yeah, it's resolvable. I think, uh, but they don't. They didn't tell me like uh, whether they have tried that yet. But on the other side, I mean, you could conceive of an infinite go, right, where there's just no borders and like you play to the. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have that uh, that amount of resources. <laughs> I mean, it seems like a straightforward extension to to try. Like, I mean, this could get rid of strategies. Yeah, that, that's true. Then you're going to have uh, maybe that's an interesting direction because you can use the perfect symmetry there. 
right? So basically, there's no board, and uh, you it's basically like a pure uh, commercial network, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, the other, so in the same vein, I guess, sort of. Um, so I, I remember from my old AI class that um, you know I think it was reinforcement learning, right? That led to people figuring out how to play backgammon better. Oh yeah. Maybe the black hammer. Anyway, something. Yeah. Um, do you, did in general, did any, did, did, did this work generally? Did the, did the bill work? Uh, did it make anybody better? Humans and go. Have, have yeah, yeah, yeah. I think uh, so, so. I think for this, uh, if you check uh, Twitter and uh, you can actually see like a lot of open go uh, comments. Yeah. So they okay. I I think I, we can sh we can actually show it right now. I'm not sure if there's a. Uh, so uh okay this is like a live dive demo <laughs> yeah so a bunch of for example this one right so basically like a, there's a, like a russian go federation that they regularly use our our our, our, our machine our like uh models <laughs> they give you suggestions uh yeah and uh, I mean, a bunch of people are basically from Asia, and they they, they want to use that. Uh, so basically, that's uh, that bunch of things. And uh, I think that people actually praise that because uh, we actually show a table showing we have released all the numbers, and they have lots of question marks. Um, oh, did they? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I think uh, a lot of people actually use that, and. Um, so this is uh, another American girl that are using it. I think uh, we actually had a small event in last year's uh, 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 Go uh, uh, event, and uh, they are basically trying to play pair goals, each of them pair with uh, a, a bot, and they're trying to compete with each other. Yeah. So yeah, there's, there's a bunch of uh, people are using it. Yeah. If you check like uh, other, maybe Korean and Japanese media, they actually have mentioned that a little bit. I have a question for your mini RTS for Yes. So in that version, you have to operate like the rock, paper, scissors, stuff. Yes, yes. I'm wondering, like, is the dynamics uh, based on Chunsta or like how is the dynamics of the Is there a kind of uh, game theory sort of implementation or? Oh yeah, we haven't incorporated game theory formally there. So we basically, unfortunately, that was tuned by human. Uh, we may basically want to make sure that they are kind of balanced. Uh, so that when you play against uh, different uh, strategies, you probably need like, for example, uh, so for example, like um, uh, Archer is, uh, when Archer competes with Lancer, Archer is favorable. You need like, a, if you want a launcher, Lancer to compete against Archer, then you need like maybe two times more units to beat against it, like something like that. So, so that the game is balanced and uh, you can see interesting uh, different strategies. Yeah, we actually collect like a, a, a few thousand different games and each of them are quite interesting. Some people either like type in like Jesus Christ in the, in, in the comments uh, because uh, when things goes wrong, they, they don't know what to do. They are pretty crazy about. So which shows that there's engagement in the game. Okay, thank you.